Italian culture. Oh, good, good. We're recording. Um, <laughs> she's author of Fascist Directive, um, Ezra Pound, and Italian Cultural Narrative, and co editor of critical editions of both versions of W.B. Yeats's A Vision. She is new to Wolf Studies. Welcome, Catherine, to Wolf Studies. I've been very excited that you've been on board. Um, so we'll start with Dr. Harris and um, her title, which you, I'll leave that to you. <laughs> okay, no problem. I'll just see if I can share my slides, which is always a little precarious, but I think it should work this time. And it looks like everybody's muted, good. Um, so I'll mute myself. Okay. Um... All right, can you see the slides? Yes. Yeah? And you can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, fantastic, all right. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank Amy and all the organizers. This has been an absolutely fabulous conference and it's just been such a joy to be part of, um, particularly because it's such a surprise that an online conference can be such a pleasure. So thank you, I, I, I've, I've just thoroughly enjoyed it and I take my hat off to you, Amy. Um, the name of my paper is Virginia Woolf, Jacques Derrida, Mysticism and Ethics. I want to begin with this wonderful excerpt from The Waves where Neville articulates a process for reading poetry well. Please listen as I read for the moment when the reader of the poem must encounter alterity with open arms. To read this poem, one must have myriad eyes. One must put aside antipathies and jealousies and not interrupt. One must have patience and infinite care and let unfold the light sound of spider's delicate feet on a leaf. Nothing is to be rejected in fear or horror. Much is sheer nonsense. One must be skeptical, but throw caution to the winds and when the door opens, accept absolutely. Also sometimes weep. Also cut away ruthlessly with a slice of the blade so it bark, hard accretions of all sorts. And so while they talk, let down one's net deeper and deeper and gently draw in and bring to the surface what he said and she said and make poetry. In this excerpt, Neville challenges us to make poetry when we read a poem. To make poetry demands the reader's active engagement, but this is an activity that is akin to fishing. It's partly passive, partly active. It requires patience, care, and a soporific dropping of one's net deeper and deeper. The line I want to draw your attention to is the reader's obligation to throw caution to the winds and when the door opens, accept absolutely. This line speaks of risk, of the risk of encountering the holy other and allowing oneself to engage with it. What separates oneself and the other is a door. However, we do not open it. We wait, patient and alert, and if we're lucky, it will open for us, and then we choose to proceed or not. The otherliness we might encounter is hinted at in the image of a spider, which never cautions must not be rejected in fear or horror. For if we reject the spider, we also lose the charming experience of its feet, delicate on a leaf. Now let's turn to an excerpt from an interview with Jacques Derrida in 1990 where he explains the ethics of approaching the future. This is not about reading poetry, but what it has in common with the above excerpt is that it's about an encounter with the holy other. And you can see the excerpt at the bottom of the slide. The future is necessarily monstrous. The future of the future that is. That which can only be surprising, that for which we are not prepared, is heralded by species of monsters all experience open to the future is prepared or prepares itself to welcome the monstrous Arabont. So what does this mean? Let's begin with the word Arabont. Um, excuse my Wagga Wagga Australian accent. Um, translated from French, it means that which or the one who arrives. Here we have three words that begin to conflate. So if you look at that um, excerpt, the, the words that conflate are future, monsters and Aravant. The repetition of future and monstrosity, which in the first line is made, are made equivalent, culminate in this arresting image at the end of a, um, of a monstrous Aravant. The wholly unknown, the future, the monster, the Aravant, 
it must be welcomed. Derek Attridge, in his excellent chapter on hospitality in the work of literature, provides one compelling reading of this. Attridge is deft in his readings, so forgive me for this brief sum up. What he says is when a monstrous Aravant arrives to our door, we must offer an unconditional welcome with a passivity that denies any sense of obligation to do so, even if the Aravant persecutes us. So I want to compare now these wonderful excerpts. Both Derrida and Wolf invoke the other as monstrous. Just as Derrida selects the word monster, Wolf chooses the grotesque image of a spider to denote alterity. Figuring the other as monstrous betrays a skepticism that Wolf and Derrida share. Whilst reading a poem, Neville doesn't just make poetry with abandon. He asserts one must be skeptical and cut away the sheer nonsense. And Derrida's monster operates as a kind of absence that defies definition. His monster stands in for the unknown, since who can define the unknown? It's like an X in algebra, and yet it is not an X. So how are we to read this monster? Derrida's monster is large enough to persecute us, victimize us, whereas Wolf's monster is a little spider. It might give you a fright, but it's probably harmless. Where Wolf urges the reader to reject fear or horror in order to be able to appreciate the delicate walk of the spider, Derrida encourages these feelings of fear or horror by emphasizing the element of surprise and our lack of preparedness for this encounter. And where Derrida describes one's home being invaded by the other, Neville positions the reader as the one who arrives to the home of the other. That is, if one has sufficient patience and care and with a level of luck, happens upon the door. So what we have when we read Wolf's encounter with alterity is an apprehension of the monstrous, but also a sense that there is an opportunity to be gifted a moment of poetry. In other words, there is a balance between doubt and hope in her writing. What we have when we read Derrida's encounter with alterity is only an apprehension of monstrosity. The doubt lingers unchecked. And my argument today is that this is, because, this is because Wolf writes in a cataphatic mystical tradition, whereas Derrida writes in an apophatic mystical tradition. There's a fine but very important difference between these traditions, which significantly impacts the ethical values these writers each promote. So what do I mean by this? Well, Wolf and Derrida can each be read within a frame of negative theology. Negative theology is about the desire to name and understand God whilst maintaining a skepticism about the possibility to do so. And let's be clear, this skepticism overwhelms the desire. Now, both Wolf and Derrida evidence a common attraction to the idea of a transcendental in the sense of a purely objective perspective on reality. They also share a direct focus on the ethical and epistemological problems of not knowing. They similarly demonstrate concerns that language might not represent the real. But within negative theology, there is the cataphatic and the apophatic, and these traditions are importantly different. I've given you an excerpt from my talk because I think this point is complicated and you might like to read along with me. Andrew Lauf defines cataphatic theology as an effort to name God as a form of praise, where the apophatic is more about the unreachable quest to understand God. Both of these approaches to making meaning are skeptical in nature and trust more to the unsaying than saying. So even as God is praised, as in cataphatic theology, this praise includes an acknowledgement that the praise is taking us beyond what we can grasp. With apophatic mysticism, this sense of ineffability becomes far more profound. And as one approaches the transcendental, affirmation becomes impossible as the power and accuracy of comprehension and linguistic expression entirely collapses. Because of Wolf and Derrida's points of commonality, because they can be read within a common frame of negative theology, previous critics have often characterized Wolf as anticipating the Derridaean privilege on absence. For example, Mark Hussey argues, the tension in her work between faith in an autonomous self 
or soul that gives meaning to the world and despair at the possibility that there is no such self anticipates an argument that is focused on in current critical thought, which is characterized by opposing views of the authenticity of literary art as an embodiment of presence. And of course, Marcassi is right. The apophatic is there in Wolf's writing. We could point to so many examples, but just one is Bernard's lamentation in the waves, that there are so many stories and none of them are true. But giving too much privilege to the apophatic in Wolf's writings can obfuscate the moments of presence in her writings. This is something that Donna Lazenby has highlighted in her reading of Wolf as a writer in the cataphatic tradition. Lazenby writes that there are constructive, concrete dimensions of Wolf's vision and literary art, whereby the artist's intuition of a transcending reality is conveyed successfully through her chosen mode of expression. And indeed, Wolf triumphantly records in her diary, upon completing the waves, it is done. And I have been sitting these 15 minutes in a state of glory and calm and some tears. How physical the sense of triumph and relief is, whether good or bad, I have netted that in in the waste of waters. I think as Wolfians, it's difficult for us to know what to do with words like these. Why do we wish to resist them? I think it's because we know that Wolf also writes in an apophatic tradition. And since we read Wolf in a post derridean era, we are not only more likely to hear the apophatic in her work, we are also more critically comfortable with it. We have all the critical tools from the hermeneutics of suspicion to hand. And since we trust that she will ultimately unsay, it's tempting to gloss over these moments of cataphatic saying as an aberration, an anomaly. But Lazenby offers a really interesting approach. She argues that Wolf's writing oscillates between the cataphatic and the apophatic. Wolf's feeling of an ecstatic oneness upon completing the waves is Wolf in the mode of the cataphatic. But she will soon move toward an apophatic mode where her mystical visions feel inaccessible and resistant to language once more. Lazenby argues, however, that for Wolf, the apophatic is not a static thing. It's not a static thing where radical absence predominates. Instead, for Wolf, it's inspiring. And when Wolf senses the fin in the waste of waters, and this feels resistant to comprehension and to expression, this apophatic vision compels her to try to put the severed parts together. So what I want to impress upon you today is that even though Wolf and Derrida are both skeptics, even though they both write in the tradition of negative theology and both trust to unsaying more than saying, Wolf is compelled far more strongly to say before the skeptical work of unsaying takes place in her writing. Of course, as Marcassi points out so beautifully, her writing does dissolve into apophatic moments, but we must attend to the moments of presence in her writing too. And the reason is this, there are important ethical ramifications at stake. So Derrida's ethics trust to doubt. Derrida's description of the Aravant aims at a kind of apophatic reduction so that in resisting all attempt at closure, truth is manifest only ever as absence. In other words, what can be said with certainty about the other is that it is unknown and that it will never be fully knowable. We can trust only to our doubts. Simon Kreitschley articulates deconstructive ethics as a philosophy of hesitation a rigorous, strictly determinate hesitation, the experience of undecidability. So where the apophatic inspires Wolf to reach toward an experience of the other and toward a mode of expression to define it, for Derrida, the apophatic is all. In deconstruction, the ethical value placed on saying, by which I mean on an an accurate understanding and naming of the, the other, the ethical value placed on this is upheld with such reverence that the only response possible is hesitation. Hesitation to presume to understand or to name. And this continues and continues as an experience of doubt, hesitation, uncertainty, ineffability. Derrida's rationalist philosophical convictions are of course, based on the Cartesian Kijido. This translates as I doubt, therefore I think that I am, as we all know. 
Now, the Oxford English Dictionary, Dictionary defines doubt as both an objective state and a subjective state. It's a state of uncertainty, an objective state, but it's also the subjective feeling of uncertainty. And whilst Derrida's writings evidence a skepticism that certainly conforms with the objective sense of this, I would contend that the subjective feeling of doubt emanates from his writings too. Why else do we have a monster rather than an X to denote the other? The monster is a figure of doubt in that it not only denotes doubt, it evokes doubt. Is it even possible to separate an act of skepticism from a feeling of doubt? Let's just stop for a moment and imagine ourselves making a skeptical decision. You might be deciding, for example, that some argument you've heard at this conference isn't quite convincing you. We've all been in that mode a few times during the conference as we're listening hard. That involves a feeling, doesn't it? Derrida's writing, because he is a philosopher and not a novelist, markedly lacks the strong affective dimension that Wolf asserts. Deconstruction trusts to skepticism, trusts to doubt, but with a denial that doubt is operating within its ethics as a feeling. So I'm taking you to the next quote on this page. Morni Joy in her essay on Derrida and negative theology well describes the effects of radical doubt at work in Derrida's writing. And I find this quote quite funny. She says, lashed to the masthead of reason, Derrida will not succumb to the siren song of experience. Yet Derrida has found a home of sorts. He has placed himself forever in the sight of the other, in the sight of the wandering signifier, the elusive other, the erratic and errant element that haunts all our presences, perhaps even his own. Now, radical doubt profoundly divides mind from body and self from world. And Joy identifies this in Derrida's writing as a refusal of the siren song of experience. Joy's imagery of Derrida lashed in the masthead of reason implies a willful blindness in Derrida's work. With his focus on the compelling arguments of unsane, Derrida is a wanderer that pursues the elusive signifier. And this journey demands a willful blindness to what can be felt and what might be said. So what might be said? Let's return to Neville's soliloquy and identify its ethics. Of course, we have an ethical obligation to engage with the other, to receive it with patience and infinite care. And this is also in Derrida's excerpt, as the Aravant must be welcomed with extreme passivity. The ethics that strike me as peculiarly cataphatic in Wolf's passage relate to the foregrounding of feeling. We have feelings explicitly named here. There's antipathies and jealousies, care, patience, weeping, fear and horror. There's also the soporific daydreamy feeling of fishing that frames the whole scene, letting one's net down deeper and deeper. Of course, we feel the skepticism. It's partly evoked as a feeling of doubt, perhaps even as an irritation with the sheer nonsense. Doubt is also described as a kind of cleansing act as we slice away soot and bark. Then when Neville's passage ends, it ends with an overt act of saying, it ends with three words of affirmation and make poetry. What jumps out at me when I read these three words is a feeling of hope for epistemological closure, a hope that anticipates the feelings of glory and calm that washed over when she finished the waves and felt that she had netted that fin in the waste of waters. Now we know, of course, that Wolf will soon counter this moment of presence in her writing with a moment of absence and indeed, We'll later read Bernard's line about there being so many stories and none of them being true. But this moment of presence is significant. What we have when we read Wolf is an ethics of hope in the face of doubt, and this makes her ethics nimble. She can receive the Aravant with a range of ethical responses. If it's grotesque, that's okay. She will be brave and hope that its alterity will include a little poetry too. With deconstruction, the feeling of skepticism is denied. And because it's denied, it's able to grow unchecked into something amorphous, shadowy, and terrifying. The deconstructive Aravon is a monster that comes in the night and beats down your door. The, these ethics are not nimble at all. In fact, we have a long list of things we must remember to do, including pretending there is no list at all and everything is absolutely fine.
So to conclude, if we read these passages side by side, if we imagine actually being the Aravon, who would you rather you met? Would you rather with Derrida throwing open his door in fear and with a determined hesitation not to name or understand you? Or Neville daydreamily fishing and wondering, hey, who might that be? Thank you. Catherine, we do. Catherine one, <laughs> Catherine two. <laughs> Share my screen again. Well, thank you, Angela. I'm going to talk a lot about the wave, so <laughs> that was perfect. Um, the title of my paper is Wolf's Mystic Materialism in the Waves. Um, so this is just a quick slide showing the thesis in the structure. Um, so the waves begins with a series of first person sensory statements. I see, I hear, etc. Spoken by Bernard, Neville, Lewis, Ginny, Susan, and Rhoda, which record a momentary impression of a sight or sound. These opening sentences do not provide additional emotional or intellectual commentary. Instead, they present intriguing and intense concentrations of physical details, which point beyond the speakers to the natural world. As a description of material realities, the introduction is very concrete, but as entry points into a natural world outside of the human speaker's internal realms, the statements gain mystery and a sense of the speakers being enmeshed in and surrounded by an environment which is describable but fundamentally different than themselves. This paper will explore how Wolf's materialism in the waves suggests an alternate view of transcendence that leads outside of the self to contemplation of the non-human world while remaining rooted in physical reality. I will begin by considering the portrayal of the material world in the opening scene. The waves begins with the first of nine descriptions of an ocean scene, chronicling the sun's path over the course of one day. The rise, ascent, and setting of the sun mirrors the lifespans of the six narrators, Bernard, Neville, Lewis, Rhoda, Susan, and Jimmy, who describe aspects of their own lives, their observations, and their understandings of themselves over the course of the novel. With the natural progression of the sun framing the character's narration, the waves signals its departure from a linear narrative plot for a more meditative form, which attempts to closely observe a natural process, but does not attempt to drive it into a human meaning or drama. The rising of the sun begins with raw visual impressions. The sea was indistinguishable from the sky. Gradually, as the sky whitened, a dark line lay on the horizon, dividing the sea from the sky, and the gray cloth became barred with thick strokes moving, one after another, beneath the surface, following each other, pursuing each other. There's a lot going on in this passage, but I simply want to note a few ideas to bring us to the subject of mysticism. First, besides the metaphor of the ocean and sky as, quote, cloth, the passage derealizes the scene into pure color a uniform gray that then divides into a lighter and darker moving path. It is a moment observed by a painter, a real-time description of what is visually occurring that makes the moment of sunrise, the emergence of light, feel new and engrossing, but also does not make the picture into a symbol or a figure. The metaphor here is an aid of a more accurate description rather than an overlay of meaning. Secondly, while the passage is written with the eye of a visual artist, it describes a picture which paints itself. In other words, the movement of the description, the genesis-like emergence of light and the division of the firmament in the deeps, take shape before our eyes automatically as they do in real life, 
but are perhaps rarely observed. We are deeply present to watch a real process of continual change that is wonderful, real, and completely inhuman. In the division of the sky and the water, Wolf puts aside the human need to order, to make phrases, to drive a plot, and brings us outside. In the two senses of being outside of a personal narrator's voice and of being outside of a house in the natural world. She brings us outside to invite us to observe nature create spontaneously. Lastly, this passage introduces the novel's titular waves, the quote, thick strokes, end quote, which bar the gray sea as a hidden force of perpetual repetitive motion. A couple points here. The waves are ever present, but disguised as visual marks within the text, the thick strokes. They require textual attention to be seen. Waves are both infinite and real, a wonder of perpetual motion that repeats and underscores the larger sequences of the book, the cycle of the day and of human life that is perhaps rarely stopped and observed. This short close reading of the opening passage brings me to what I mean by Wolf's mystical materialism. I will start with the second term first. Wolf's ocean scene does not describe anything out of the ordinary or particularly meaningful in a human sense. But her close observation of the endless and spontaneous changes of the natural world encounters the everyday as a site of such rich wonder that they are factually impossible to fully mine with either words or art. As Bernard later says, quote, I am astonished as I draw the veil off of things with words how much, how infinitely more than I can say I have observed, end quote. He is not exaggerating here. Wolf draws the mind with wonder to the fact of the infinity of the natural world in relation to the human mind. Crucially, all of this wonder is to be found within the bounds of the material, the finite and physical world. To define mysticism, I will turn to Wolf's contemporary, Evelyn under Evelyn Underhill, who wrote the following, quote, Mysticism is the art of union with reality. Mystic is a person who has attained that union in greater or less degree, who aims at and believes in such attainment, end quote. Mysticism for Underhill, and I would argue for Wolf, does not represent a supernatural perspective, but a state of deep presence and attention, a disposition of the self, and even gratitude towards experience. The presence and attention requires that the observer has cultivated two conditions that also re reappear throughout the book, solitude and silence. Throughout the waves, no character speaks with another, although they mention each other. Each speaks only for and with themselves. Their solitude is an undercurrent, a fundamental condition beating beneath the passing stream of their lives. Several speakers describe solitude as a place at the borders of identity, a space where the self can be most free, and in being so, become less and less of a discreet entity. While the children are still in school, Rhoda says, quote, I have a short time alone. I have a short space of freedom, end quote. And later, as a young woman, Ginny states, quote, I want to give and be given and solitude to unfold my possessions, end quote. For both women in these moments, solitude is a reprieve and an opportunity to return to and recollect the self. More often, however, characters describe solitude as a freedom which diffuses the self or as a reflection on the social nature of identity. Rhoda says later in the novel, quote, alone, I often fall down into nothingness, end quote. And Bernard, the maker of phrases, states, quote, the truth is that I need the stimulus of other people. Alone over my dead fire, I tend to see the thin places in my own stories. And the addition of other people ends solitude and pins down identity, but in doing so limits the natural multiplicity of the single self. As Bernard wonderfully addresses Neville within his imagination, so still alone, quote, let me then create you, end quote. And straightforwardly, quote, I do not believe in separation. We are not single. And enough himself, quote, to be contracted by another person into a single being, how strange. For I am more self than Neville thinks. 
We are not as simple as our friends would have us to meet their needs. We enter into each speaker's consciousness in their solitude as their most true selves, most in relation to reality and therefore most mystical selves. The second condition for wolves mystical materialism in the waves, which I will briefly touch on, is silence as a precondition for attentive presence. Importantly, the entire book is narrating human silence. The birds sing and the waves fall on the shore, but the course of the sun through the sky and the narration of the character's interior lives occurs in the silence of the mind. Bernard, who strives to describe the world in words, reflects on the failure of language near the end of the novel, stating, quote, I have done with phrases, end quote, and strives towards a purer representation, perhaps touch, quote, I need a little language such as lovers use, end quote, or silence itself. He states, quote, how much better is silence? Let me sit here forever with bare things, this coffee cup, this knife, this fork, things in themselves, myself being myself, let me sit on and on, silent, alone, end quote. His solitude and silence lets him commune with objects in himself as they are, a union with reality that remains material, but finds transcendence in moving beyond the surface of things, to see the richness and variety of things as they are. To consider the nature of transcendence in the waves, I want to look at two sets of passages. First, moments where consciousness fuses with the material world. And second, moments where supernatural belief and relatedly sentiments conveyed through language fail to bring the subject outside of his own consciousness. To return to the, to turn to the first set of passages. While playing as a child and hiding from his friends, Lewis experiences himself as a yew tree. Quote, my hair is made of leaves. I am rooted to the middle of the earth. My body is a stalk, end quote until he is kissed by Ginny and all, his, all is shattered. His image of being rooted recurs several other times throughout the novel. Quote, my roots are threaded like fibers in a flower pot, round and round about the world. And, and again at school, notably when he feels the security of being in chapel with the other praying boys, he describes the moment as a fusion with earth, not heaven. Quote, I feel come over me the sense of the earth under me, and my roots going down and down until they wrap themselves round some hardness at the center." End quote. In all of these moments, Lewis experiences either a departure or extension from his physical body, not in spiritual terms, but by imagining himself as incorporated more intensively in the natural world. This more intensive experience of the non-human world as a transcendent departure from normal consciousness strikingly occurs in a, in a couple passages which mention supernatural belief. Bernard stumbles into a church in London, hoping for a, for a spiritual escape from the claustrophobic streets. Quote, I stray and look and wonder, and sometimes rather furtively try to rise on the shaft of somebody else's prayer into the dome, out beyond wherever they go. And like the lost and wailing dove, I find myself flailing, fluttering, descending and perching upon some curious gargoyle, some battered no nose or absurd tombstone with humor, with wonder, and so again watching the sightseers with their Baedekers shuffling past, while the boy's voice soars in the dome and the organ now and then indulges in a moment of elephantine triumph." The aborted flight of Bernard's prayer returns him to close observation of his surroundings and with them, humor and wonder. Unsubstantiated words are trumped by the immediacy of the physical world, which in turn offers an endless fascination to the attentive self. Near the end of his life, Bernard records a similar circular flight. The passage begins with a moment of spiritual exaltation as he considers his release in old age from physical desire. Quote, but no more. Now, tonight, my body rises tier upon tier like some cool temple whose floors strewn with carpets and murmurs rise and the altars stand smoking. The body itself has become the place of worship, a fitting place it would seem from which to launch a spiritual ascent. The bird continues, quote, when I look down from this transcendency, how beautiful are even the crumbled relics of bread, 
like shapely spirals the peelings of pears make, how thin and mottled like some seabird's egg. I could worship my hand even with its pan of bones laced by blue mysterious veins, end quote. From the temple to the breakfast table. Bernard's release from the constraints of the body does not free him for supernatural belief, but for a more intense savoring of the material world. As opposed to places made out of words, phrases which may lead the mind into imagination or even faith, and which must remain disembodied and therefore utterly enclosed by the self. The material world, although ordinary, provides an authentic alternative to the limits of the human and an opportunity for wonder at what is genuinely completely other to our consciousness. I'll conclude with just a couple last thoughts um, uh, that I think relate probably to Angela's um, paper and research and also um, to this topic in general. Um, the first thing I was struck by was just that um, this intensification of perception of the material world and accompanying sense of transcendence seems very tied to the novel's emphasis on the passage of time and the shortness of life. It's a quote where Bernard is talking about finitude, quote, marriage, death, travel, friendship, town and country, children and all that, a many-sided substance cut out of this dark and many-faceted flower. Let us stop for a moment. Let us behold what we have made. Let it blaze against the yew trees. One light, there, it is over, gone out. And then the second, um, reflection I had thinking about this topic was just the affect of joy. Um, that well, a sense of temporal perspective results from this sense of finitude. Um, I noticed that uh, the heightened perception of the material world leads to a kind of wondering joy as a predominant affect in the novel. Um, and maybe across all of Wolf, <laughs> it could be interesting to talk about. Um, and this is just a quick quote from Neville about that, where he's reveling in the reality of life, quote, in a world which contains the present moment, why discriminate? Let it exist, this bank, this beauty, and I for one instant steeped in pleasure. A leaf falls from joy. Oh, I am in love with life. I'll end there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Catherine. And now we have Catherine. I can't hear you, Catherine. I think you're muted. That was a, an auspicious start. I'm putting two things in the chat. Um, one is a handout because I have three long passages that I'm going to just dabble in and if you want to see the whole things um they're there and then the second one is an access copy of my paper in case that's useful to you okay for me the handout will not work for sure. uh, i don't know why but okay i i also have copies of them i'll just try to upload them myself and see if that works okay better. okay great thanks is the screen sharing working better it's working great we can fantastic see okay um and i also want to just thank amy for this incredible conference and all of her sort of co-conspirators. This has been an amazing four days. So I begin with an installation made by ceramicist and writer Edmund DeWall, because it's this work that led me to wonder, what does Wolf mean when she writes of a particular kind of pause in her essay, Abbeys and Cathedrals? DeWall's work, A Local History, installed in 2012 in and around the Allison Richards Building at Cambridge University, comprises three vitrines sunk into the pavement, and inside each is an array of pots and dishes made by DeWall, primarily of porcelain. Some are simple porcelain jars 
while others are molded from 13th century Chinese pots or imitations of wedgewood and sev plates. Some are plain white, while others are adorned with gold lacquer in the Japanese tradition of gilding a broken object that is most precious. Some pots are visible, while others are hidden behind other pots not meant to be seen. The vitrines are unlit, and the glass covering them is not just for protection, but to also occlude the view. Dewell says, these vitrines are meant to be discovered, to be happened upon as you come and go across the site. They are there to make you pause momentarily. The pause he asks of a viewer is brief, fleeting even. It might elicit reflection or even change a person's trajectory or thought patterns, but it doesn't have to. DeWall reflects more extensively on the opportunity enabled by a momentary pause in his book, Letters to Commando, I'm sorry, Commando of 2021, which accompanies an installation of ceramics he made among the art and decorative objects in Moise de Commando's house museum in Paris. DeWall considers Commando's collection and the way a collection can halt change, keep things still, still the word still the world, to use his words. An installation is sort of like this, but also slightly different. He says, if the installation works, there's roominess in it, a sort of shrug of something being safe to let go, leave. It isn't a need for fixity, a dogma of not moving, but the apprehension that just briefly, the world has paused. The velocity of things bundling from place to place, hand to hand, from my kiln to dealer to collection can just be slowed. It is a breath turn, a seizure. The brevity of this pause is its power. Things do not need to stay the same forever. DeWall's installations do not want a dogma, just a breath turn. It is with DeWall's insistence on a pause that I encountered three pauses in quick succession during a wolf salon in Wolf's essay, Abbeys and Cathedrals of 1932, one of a group of short pieces she published in Good Housekeeping and that have come to be known as the London scene. And this is gonna be the first um, long passage on the handout. If the handout is available, I don't know. In this essay, Wolf contrasts the busy bustle of modern London with the peace that tombs in various churches and gardens can afford or thinking back to Duval's language, the velocity of things bundling from place to place can just be slowed. In two paragraphs of this essay, she introduces a pause three times. The first two seem to belong to an old way of thinking, which Wolf questions. They occur in, a small, in the small church of St. Mary Labau. Wolf describes a tomb of an ordinary woman where, quote, all, posteris, all posterity is asked to pause and rejoice that Mrs. Mary Lloyd closed an exemplary and spotless life without suffering and indeed without regaining consciousness aged 79 years. Wolf then reflects wryly that all, all these terms ask viewers to pause, reflect, admire, take heed of your ways, adding how odd it now seems that these bodies of ordinary people might still take up so much space physically and mentally, when modernity itself demands so much space. And, quote, the mere process of keeping alive needs all our energy. A few sentences later, she moves to St. Paul's Cathedral and is halted. We have no time, we were about to say, to think about life and death either, when suddenly we run against the enormous walls of St. Paul's. Here it is again looming over us, mountainous, immense, grayer, colder, quieter than before. And directly we enter, we undergo that pause and expansion and release from hurry and effort, which it is in the power of St. Paul's more than any other building in the world to bestow. So where the previous two pauses reside in an outdated sensibility and even allow a moment of mockery, St. Paul's retains this ability to relieve her speaker of the modern hustle and bustle into a moment of changed breath, 
a step away from distraction, how your mind is nudged or even rearranged when you happen upon something that makes you pause. That third incident of a pause in abbeys and cathedrals puzzled me because again and again in Wolf's essays, pause appears as a kind of deliberate intellectual expansion, an opportunity to think harder about a thing, perhaps notice facets of an idea that had heretofore been missed, challenge accepted interpretations or cast them aside. Indeed, Eve Sorum argues convincingly that Wolf regularly deploys a pause in pedagogical contexts as a means of upsetting ideas of mastery and patriarchal interpretation. These kinds of pauses abound. For example, in Reflections at Sheffield Place, Wolf asks, did the historian himself ever pause here to cast a phrase? And then toward the end of phases of fiction, after discussions of so many novelists, she writes, and here we may pause, not certainly that there are no more books to read or no more changes of mood to satisfy, but for a reason which springs from the youth and vigor of art itself. Or in On Rereading Novels, she writes of Scott and Flaubert saying, we may even go on to say that the vigor and splendor of youth almost outweigh the more deliberate virtues of maturity. And then we may pause upon the significance of almost and wonder whether perhaps it has not some bearing upon our reluctance to read the Victorians twice. Or there's the noticed setting aside of one thing to allow for another, as in the docks of London, which was also published in Good Housekeeping, when the men working on the docks are yet able to pause in their work to say to the casual visitor, would you like to see what sort of thing we sometimes find in sacks of cinnamon? Look at this snake. These pauses appear in the voice of Wolf, the measured thinker plotting her prose and its effect on readers with tremendous control. And now if the handout is available, I'm, I'm moving on to the second passage there. The voice of abbeys and cathedrals seems to be aware that, that that control can be illusory, that we are always susceptible to the nudge of things beyond ourselves. She identifies a similar experience in reading Lawrence Stern's The Life and Work of Tristram Shandy saying, in phases of fiction that stern by the beauty of his style has let us pass beyond the range of personality into a world which is not altogether the world of fiction, it is above. There's a section break and she continues, certain phrases have raised us out of the atmosphere of fiction. They have made us pause to wonder. She then has a quotation from Stern and concludes, Phrases like this bring, by the curious rhythm of their phrasing, by a touch on the visible sense, an alteration in the movement of the mind, which makes it pause and widen its gaze and slightly change its attention. We are looking out at life in general. There's a clear structural echo between the movement of the mind here to that in abbeys and cathedrals where she speaks of pause and widen its gaze. Sorry, there's a clear movement between the mind here and its pause and widen its gaze and slightly change its attention to that in abbeys and cathedrals where she speaks of pause and expansion and release from hurry and effort. There's something not intellectual, but more rooted in the sudden and even unexpected experience of humanity widening beyond itself about what can happen in powerful literature or the awe-inspiring space of the cathedral. The self expands into something outside the day-to-day -day, or even outside of modernity with all its confidence that everything is understood, nailed down, contained. It isn't, Wolf seems to suggest in both cases. An installation, and here I'm wishing we could be experiencing Anton Knudsen's um, installation of Kew Gardens that maybe we can next year. An installation particularly where it involves objects placed in an unexpected location, and particularly when visitors to that location already have expectation about how space works there, could experientially cause a visitor to pause, to be surprised, 
but that experience is harder to create in a literary work. A direction that a reader should pause in a particular place would not have that halting effect of say, unexpected pottery underground to surprise a reader into a pause. Wolf seems frequently to show a pause happening to someone else, whether it's her as a critic or a character in one of her novels. This pause might be as simple as an inserted beat between speakers or between a single speaker's sentences, a pause that allows action or dialogue to unfold more dramatically. She describes how this kind of pause might function in the distinction she draws between reading Shakespeare on the page and seeing Twelfth Night on stage. She says, perhaps the most impressive effect in the play is achieved by the long pause which Sebastian and Viola make as they stand looking at each other in a silent ecstasy of re recognition. The reader's eye may have skipped over that moment entirely. Here, we are made to pause and think about it and are reminded that Shakespeare wrote for the body and for the mind simultaneously. A pause in Wolf's fiction, and this is the third passage on the handout, might also be much more extensive, such that when a character pauses, a lengthy paragraph or even more of thoughts and unspoken action interject into the scene. For instance, there's a moment in Night and Day when Catherine reads through several letters trying to understand the situation of her cousin Cyril, who is living and fathering children with a woman not his wife, and about whom Catherine's aunt Celia has strong opinions based in propriety. Having spent time with those letters and wondering what others might think or say, Catherine reflected, pausing by the window, which as the night was warm, she raised in order to feel the air upon her face and to lose herself in the nothingness of night. From there, she listens to the sound of far off traffic. She's reminded of the constraints of her own life compared with those of others. She remembers her connection to William Rodney and concludes that there is no way to escape other people or her own situation. These things all happen during her pause. The sensory experience of the air on her face brings her out of the study of letters and into a different mindset altogether. This is different from the critical pauses and asides that help to complicate an exploration. It's a shift into a different kind of being. In Friday's session about moments of being, speakers noted that such moments can range from the epiphanic to the ordinary, and that often these moments can be brought on by an external stimulus. I think this example from Night and Day shows some of the connections between the momentary pause of an unexpected and interrupting sensation and the heightened awareness that can come from a moment of being. But unlike that pause in night and day, the pause in abbeys and cathedrals does not lead to anything specific. No new way of seeing, no outcome beyond the experience of the pause itself. And directly we enter, we undergo that pause and expansion and release from hurry and effort, which it is in the power of St. Paul's more than any other building in the world to bestow. After that pause, that expansion, the essay moves on to a lengthy description of the interior of St. Paul's, its size, serenity, and its tombs, and the wit of Wolfe's assessment of England's legacy returns. But none of that has to do with the pause, which simply happens. This moment in abbeys and cathedrals might be more akin to other quick pauses that occur early in a couple of Wolfe's novels. I think of the opening of the waves where Wolf describes the motion of waves approaching the shore. She says, as they neared the shore, each bar rose, heaped itself, broke, and swept a thin veil of white water across the sand. The wave paused and then drew out again, sighing like a sleeper whose breath comes and goes unconsciously. And in Mrs. Dalloway, for having lived in Westminster, how many years now? Over 20, one feels even in the midst of traffic or waking at night, Clarissa was positive, a particular hush or solemnity, an indescribable pause, a suspense, that that might be her heart affected, they say, by influenza before Big Ben strikes. A turn of a wave, a breath turn, 
unconscious breath, a particular hush. Those indescribable pauses bring a busy wandering mind back to the present moment and needn't lead to extraordinary insight. I don't feel I've quite gotten it about the importance of this kind of pause in Wolf's work, but I'm working on it. And I continue to find this connection with DeWall important. I have for this paper limited myself to literal designations of pauses and only in a few texts, but I would like to think harder about ellipses, whether literal or implied, dashes, and other representations of pauses to find more of this kind of pause, the turn of the wave, the turn of the breath, the particular hush that returns us to the present. For both DeWall and Wolf, this return to the present is an ethical imperative. One must stay connected to the bodily present, not get swept away by thoughts and imagination, however important those things are. Thanks. Thank you all, we have questions. Uh, please don't be shy about raising your hand or putting your question in the chat. Um, I'll ask a question if uh, no one has one just to get the ball rolling. Oh, wait, Catherine, you go first. I had a question for Angela because um, I've been thinking a little bit about the Gothic and I was just interested in if you thought about the connection between sort of the Gothic sense of the uncanny where um, something which is familiar suddenly becomes sort of defamiliarized or strange and um, the monsters that you were talking about in Derrida and um, the other in Wolf. And I guess you were focusing on um, the sort of um, the fact that Wolf presents a worldview that um, balances doubt and hope. Um, I was wondering if you see any kind of darker side to Wolf's um, doubt or focus on the other. Is there kind of a potential for alienation there that you noticed? Oh, these are wonderful questions. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I often think that her moments of being involved a lot of uncanniness because um, I'm just trying to think of a really good example. Let me think. Um, you, I mean, we could take um, just Lily Briscoe, for example, when she's got these fighting um, sensations about the Ramsey family the familiar and the unfamiliar are mingling and they can take you into strange places but I guess it, it depends actually on the moment of being because I think one of the panels were on earlier were was about the voyage out and um there's a there's a particularly uncanny scene in the engagement scene there which I wouldn't say that there's any epiphany but certainly in the moment that Rachel Binrace becomes engaged there's such um a sensation of otherliness that you're thrown into a kind of a very uncanny scene where as a reader you can't actually work out what's happening because the the familiar and the unfamiliar are clashing so much um so so yes i i definitely think that i often think of the um structure of our moment of being as a little like the um drawing that wolf made about to the lighthouse when she was working it out as a kind of a bridge with uh two landings uh, or she did it as an H, um, but I, I think of it as a kind of um, bridge because what happens is um, you have characters that have an initial moment of being a little bit like Rachel Vinrace's touching alterity, and then they go into this uncanny space. Um, and there are some characters who like to be there, like John from Solid Objects, just stays there. And then there are other characters who are really um, motivated to get to the other side, like Lily Briscoe and have the aha moment. But certainly I think that the uncanny is a terribly creative space where you're trying to um, figure out how to um, integrate the, the familiar and the unfamiliar. Um, and so when you say, do I see it as dark? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it can go very wrong. And, um, and, I, and that, 
that wonderful line from Mrs. Dalloway where it's dangerous to live just one day. I, I think we have to take seriously it. You have characters like Rhoda and Septimus who can't survive that journey through um, an experience that is just so otherly that they can't cope. They can't work out how, what to do with it. So thank you for your question. <laughs> There's a question in the chat. Uh, thanks, Jane, from Marlene. Um, she was wondering where Wolf is also introducing her own novel, a play poem after all marked by the he said, she said constructions of the, solilo of the soliloquies as the radical other inviting us to engage with the novel's alterity as it monstrously breaks with traditional genre distinct divisions. Marlene, I love that comment and I hadn't seen that, but I think that's absolutely brilliant. So thank you. There's a comment too from Christina in the chat um, about Derrida. Yes, I, I just Levinas. saw it. Yeah, um, I, I would agree that um, Levinas is a more cataphatic writer. And um, in my PhD thesis, I actually wrote a chapter on this because I think that, as you say, um, figuring the other is monstrous isn't very ethical. I, I, I think when Levinas talks about the face, um, that I can't think who it was. There's this wonderful um, critic who, um, who works in London and his name will come to me. I've got his book on my shelf, but he writes this fantastic piece looking at um, Levinas and Beckett. And what he says is that their writings are um, an effort to unsay, but they're filled with so much effect that you cannot think of them as um, having the same ethics as deconstruction because they're far too cataphatic. Um, and so, yes, I, I agree with you, Christina. I'll find his book. <laughs> I have a follow-up question. Um, uh, for Angela uh, in terms of that uncanny space and perhaps it's more obvious for Septimus, but what is it do you think that doesn't enable Rhoda to survive that uncanny space? I, I mean, I don't know, but what I do think happens in Wolf is that if you cannot make meaning, I, I do think Wolf always starts with epistemology, with making meaning. And if you cannot make meaning, then it threatens your ontology. And um, Rhoda um, is a character who um, cannot accept the idea of being named, cannot accept that reduction. And it, it is actually quite, uh, I was thinking of her when I was writing this piece actually, because that is um, a little like the um, Derrida and hesitation taken so far that when she can't, accept it she can't offer it and then she can't actually make meaning so um it in it definitely in Wolf's characters this this necessity to be able to form your own identity through an epistemological process if that doesn't happen if that can't take place then your ontology is totally threatened and it happens also with Jacob in Jacob's room he's mm -hmm. another character who the process of making meaning when it begins to break down in that book and he feels so defined by the older generation. Um, there's a wonderful line in the book that is about his father and his father's grave. And it says, well, if he wasn't that, because I think the mother puts on the grave that he was a merchant and um, the narrator owns that he wasn't really a merchant. If he wasn't that, was he nothing? And as you go through and Jacob's trying to work out his identity, this line haunts him. If he isn't, if he isn't able to actually find an identity, is he ontologically nothing? And so I think um, in Wolf, there's, there's a strong connection between making meaning, identity forming, and ontology. That's fascinating. Thank you.
I have a question or a comment um, for Catherine. Catherine, thank you. That was really lovely. Um, I love Edmund DeWall's work, both his uh, ceramic work, but also his writing. Um, so I'm thinking about, this isn't entirely thought out, so I'm gonna, I might ramble a little bit, but I'm thinking about how Edmund DeWall's vitrines in a local history that make you pause momentarily, they do that while you're moving through the space of a city, right, through London. And so I'm thinking about how Wolf's writing, especially the first example you gave with the abbeys and the cathedrals, she's moving through the space of London as well, of, of a city, right? And then there are also, so I started to think about what are the, what are the spaces of the other pauses in that she writes about? And sometimes, and I haven't thought through all of them yet, I mean, it, but sometimes they're in the interior and sometimes they're exterior. And sometimes that interior is actually inside of a room or a building, a physical interior space. And then other times it's in an imaginative space. Right, and then other times it's in an exterior space. And it might, yeah, they might get conflated sometimes too. So there's just that, that thinking there. But I also started to think about how always when you talked about, you said always that not intellectual of the pause, the pause always seems to be affective, right? It's that moment of, of not knowing something of, of sensing something before it starts to maybe make sense, maybe it never makes exact sense that it can't entirely be put into words. And so when you started talking at the end of your paper about the ellipses and the, um, you know, the different ways that Wolf speaks about, speaks of pauses, I don't know, I'm, it's, as I said, it's not entirely formulated, but there, there's something really nice and kind of exciting in that. Well, that's really, I'm really intrigued by the different things that you've brought together there. I think, I think maybe the moment in Mrs. Dalloway and the moment in Abbeys and Cathedrals are the most, of the things I've found, are the most akin to what happens um, with DeWall's local history, because they are, those are both sort of moving through space and moving through urban space, um, built space. And, you know, that that moment in the beginning of the waves obviously is sort of very much immersed in natural space, right? Where she's um, sort of laying out uh, this environment into which the different speakers are going to be placed. Um, but it's still very much movement, right? It's, um, it's the movement of the water um maybe instead of the movement of a of a person whether that water is a person is the question i haven't quite resolved for myself um but what you say about it being an affective moment instead of an intellectual moment i think is also really interesting because i think you're right that it is about sensation and not about thinking and i think i mean that for me is what makes you know those moments that the, you know, the moment in abbeys and cathedrals, the moment in the waves and in Mrs. Dalloway, so distinct, I think, from, from the essays. And, you know, um, Catherine's experience of, of opening the window is, is in a way the, the introduction of, of an outside into her inside, right? Um, both with the air coming into the room and, you know, all of these things sort of coming into her reading of the letters. Um, and so I think there's there's interesting sort of interplay there. I'm really glad you brought those things up. Thank you. Amanda, I think that, oh, Anne's just got a hand raised. Um. Yeah, Catherine, I just had an idea and it's maybe a bit off, but um, I, I recently read Donna Lazenby's um, book on a mystical philosophy and she writes this wonderful chapter um, about Wolf and the Cataphatic and she compares um, Wolf to, I'm going to mispronounce his name, but I think it's Plotinus, but 
something she talks about that's fascinating is um, this, this moment of preparing yourself for a mystical experience as being very important to actually having one. And I don't know if it's of interest to you, but that might be an interesting thing for you to read and just wonder about the connections between this um, sort of preparation and the pause that Wolf um, is describing in, in her writings. I need a moment because I thought you were talking to the other Catherine. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Yeah, no. Would, uh, would you mind just kind of restating that? Because I was I was looking fine. at these incredible things okay. in the chat. And I, I even have a visual prop, which I just pulled out from under my laptop, which was propping it up. So here we go. So this is what I was saying. I'm, I'm sure you know this book, but it's just um, I only read it recently and found it absolutely fascinating. Um, and Donna Lazenby um, talks about Wolf and um, and a mystical tradition of writing. And where it might connect to pause for you is that um, she talks about uh, this process that mystics have of preparing themselves for that moment of epiphany. And I mean, I didn't read it with that in mind, but I just wonder if that might have some interesting connections to the pause that you're talking about, where you attempt to ready yourself to see the real. I don't know that work, and so thank you. I, I want to go and read it. Um, well, you you know, treat. say again. You're in for a treat. It is lovely. It's very, <laughs> that's very great. Good. I mean, I think my my first thought is that these are there are also the pauses for which you can't prepare, and I think maybe what a what a mystic does is maybe the preparation that can happen for those, those surprises is knowing that they're gonna be, you know, important, right? So, so instead of sort of ignoring them, dismissing them, moving on, you know, without thinking, sort of allowing for those things as, as something that could happen, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, yeah, I, earlier someone asked about, um, Amy, can you hook up your mic? Sorry, thank you. Let's forget. You're so flaky. Uh, um, earlier somebody asked about, I think it was Deborah asking about, you know, why some, why some people are, um, able to, um, survive this encounter with the uncanny and then, you know, Rhoda and Septimus can't. And one of the ways I always think about this, I think I cannot remember where this quote is from. It's been in my, you know, those quotes that have been with you for 25 years, but it might've been Jung or some, some other person in that tradition talking about like the difference between the mystic and the psychotic is one of them dives into the ocean of the unconscious and can swim and the other one falls into it. And you, the way Angela, Angie's comment on that preparation and Catherine's response to that as the sort of distinction between like this pause that kind of comes upon you and then this pause that you can prepare for, I, I feel it sort of resonates with that distinction. Um, it's always been a really interesting, to me, it's just always stuck in my head as a really resonant thing. And, and I think I'm thinking about this as connected to Marlene's Wonderful. Thank you so much for bringing in that quotation from Diary 3, Marlene. It's a beautiful moment. I just want to read part of it and because um, it connects to Catherine's. I woke up at perhaps at three. Oh, it's beginning. It's coming. The horror physically like a painful wave swelling about the heart, tossing me up. I'm unhappy, unhappy, down. God, I wish I were dead. Pause. But why am I feeling this? Let me watch the wave rise. I watch. That is such a beautiful moment of this, of something that is, uh, I think it was a Catherine Enright. I'm not, when you, you talked earlier about, or maybe as Catherine, Paul, you're all merging together, everybody. <laughs> My brain's too full. Um, 
the ethics of this kind of um, self resistance, this kind of stepping outside of your habitual mode of seeing and the attempt to welcome in something else that is not your habit. Um, to me, that's the most important thing in the entire world like that if I had one thing that I care about in the world it's that like that's the, that's it. And so um, it's so beautiful to see that's actually what I love about wolf too, right her constant interrogation of that those habits and this moment is so beautiful as this kind of liberatory but well maybe that word is too strong but as this kind of like resistance to her own self and her own self destructive tendency you know, to which I guess I just, I just feel that empathetically since I, maybe everybody has that, right? Like, this is what our minds do. We, we tear ourselves down and then you have to say, pause. <laughs> Why am I thinking this, right? To me, that is just stunningly beautiful and so powerful. And I just wanted to weave those together and thank you. I just love it. I'll stop talking now. <laughs> You know, I think that that diary is so wonderful and, and thank you Marlene for putting it there and, and Amy for highlighting it. I think, you know, that's very much what the sort of return to the present can be is this step outside of the garbage in your head, which isn't always garbage, right? I mean, there's an insistence in Wolf's work that, that the things in your head matter and are important and are um, fruitful, but not always. I was thinking while you were speaking about, um, well, first, uh, when you talked that great quote about um, diving versus falling into the ocean of the unconscious. And I was thinking a lot about um, sort of solitude and silence in the waves as part of my paper as a precondition for this kind of mystical perception of the natural world. And it strikes me that there's like these different kinds of solitude and silence. Um, if you maybe aren't prepared to dive into that um, ocean of the unconscious, you're not prepared for your sort of journey through the uncanny to, to not be mirrored back to you by other people. So you're kind of surprised by that loneliness or that solitude, um, as opposed to a more considered, I guess, voyage out, right? <laughs> voyage into the uncanny. I was thinking about that in relation, like comparing Bernard and Septimus, that they both have this desire to communicate these experiences of presence that are outside of their ordinary consciousness. For Septimus, it's like this catastrophic experience that he, he thinks he should be able to, and he can't, and his experiences are not mirrored back. And there's, that's also something there about the limits of identity. Um, Whereas, uh, you know, Bernard wants to communicate and he talks about this need for pure language, but he also sort of um, has a larger view that he is here and other people are there. And there's, um, there, this bridge might not be able to be crossed, that, you know, phrases will fail. And, and I don't necessarily think that he is happy about it, but, um, it just seems like there's something there about agency um, and uh, being prepared for being alone um, that's different between the two experiences. Catherine, I think that's wonderful. And I wonder if um, there's that great scene where Neville and Bernard are on the train and trying to talk to a plumber. And I think you uh, what you're talking about works really well with looking at Neville in that scene because he says something about how um, Bernard doesn't get the alterity of the plumber because he's too busy um, kind of talking and thinking that he sees what he expects to see. Whereas Neville's kind of happy in his solitude and has this really large inner world. So I just I, I just thought I'd mention it because it, it's what, what you, um, made me think of.
Marlene, do you want to go? Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, explain why I brought this um, diary quote up, um, and I was so intrigued by by your reading of of, of Paulus, Catherine. Um, I think what's also important is that, or what what I saw in this in this in this particular pause right in the middle of this of this diary entry, is that it al also has um, a structuring um, um, uh, purpose. So I, I think. Um, just when she's about to to be overwhelmed by her emotions, she writes this this word. She writes pause, so she interrupts um, her own her own um, process of thinking. So, um, and I think this is this is perhaps really also the sovereignty of the artist and something that someone like Septimus, for instance, lacks. So he is depicted in Mrs. Dalloway. Um, unlike Clarissa, as someone who's who's almost already drowned and cannot rise to the surface, whereas Clarissa can do that. And I think what 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 is so intriguing about Wolf is that writing itself can become this kind of pause where you you know you can control control emotions or thought that threaten to overwhelm you. And I, yeah, th this is the reason I brought this up because I think it is inherently um, also a structuring principle. And it, it it's also because, you know, I want to go against just reading. I mean, I'm, I've just submitted my, my book manuscript um, about water. So this quote was very much on my mind. Um, I just want to, um, even though we're talking about, you know, kind of oceans of consciousness, I want to try to, I want to question uh, these metaphors because I think um, it's not simply a, a stream of consciousness or flow, but there are those moments where she consciously um, um, interrupts and disrupts um, and, and actually shows us how much structuring principles are behind her, her, um, her writing. That's really wonderful, Marlene. I, I think you're exactly right. And, and I love what you're saying about writing, right? As the thing that can can bring that interruption or that pause. And that's something I really want to think more about. So thank you so much. Um, Jane, do you want to go? Yeah, I've got a question for for all three speakers, really. That I'm, I'm thinking in this discussion, I'm thinking of a particular pause um, that Angie talked about right at the end of the paper, that moment where Wolf has just finished the waves and that moment of glory and calm. And she says, you know, she's netted the fin and then she thinks that she might dedicate it to Toby, but then she doesn't. Um, and I just wondered if any of the speakers could, could speak to that in terms of what we're thinking about here, about pauses um, and about maybe mysticism and the stepping outside of self um looking out of a window it seems it seems a very rich passage so I'd love to hear what uh, what you think of it may I grab it I'm just going to grab it for a second one moment sorry if somebody else wants to go first I'll just get a copy of it once Sorry, I may have asked about something a bit too sort of specific, but it just seemed a, a moment of pause that relates very closely to the, the waves that all three of you... Question. No, I, I think it's a lovely... Uh, <laughs> Catherine, Catherine or Catherine, do you... <laughs> I most definitely do not want to go first. <laughs> I can say something generally about pause and connected to my paper, but I don't have a specific reading of that moment. Um, but um, I guess just quickly say, I think the moment where I saw this pause that I was interested in, um, in the context of my paper was um, these moments where characters were um, sort of beginning to pray or beginning to <laughs> think in terms of uh, religious faith or a movement out of the body. And I noticed that there are these two moments where um, 
it's this it kind of, I thought of it as an image of like a circular light or something like that, where it's, a, it's about to step out of the body, but in a, um, on the, the wings of words, right? As opposed to perception of the outside physical world. And um, the both moments when Bernard's in the cathedral and then again, when he has, he's reflecting on sort of being released from physical desire um, Wolf brings him back into this mode of intense perception that is um, observatory. Um, so he's in the cathedral and he returns with humor and wonder outside of the, you know, the shaft of prayer is the, is the phrase into this noticing of the tourists um, and like the organ and, and it works. It's the same, um, his desire to be released from the streets of London is the bill, right? So like it works, but it's different. And then similarly, I was struck again by all this imagery is building up about the body of the temple and the altars are burning and, um, and the culmination of it is the breakfast table and the peelings of the pears and the crumbs on the, um, on the tablecloth. Um, so that's, those are two moments that I was thinking about as a kind of um, pause that allows for a change in direction or, or an upsetting of expectation or something for the passage. But I'll stop there because I can't speak to the room of one's own. So. <laughs> Uh, I have it, Jane, so I can read it to everyone if you like. Yeah, okay. okay. Um, I wrote the words, oh, death, 15 minutes ago, having reeled across the last 10 pages with some moments of such intensity and intoxica intoxication that I seemed only to stumble after my own voice or almost after some sort of speaker as when I was mad. I'm just going to say at that point that that is such a moment of ecstasy, isn't it, where you're mm -hmm. actually beside yourself. So mm -hmm. she's, she's in the midst of a moment of being, I would say. I was almost afraid remembering the voices that used to fly ahead. And Amy, doesn't that sound like falling in rather than swimming? Anyhow, it is done. And I have been sitting these 15 minutes in a state of glory and calm and some tears, thinking of Toby. And if I could write Julian Toby Stephen, 1881 to 1906 on the first page, I suppose not. How physical the sense of triumph and relief is, whether good or bad, it's done. And, I, and as I certainly felt at the end, not merely finished, but rounded off, completed the things stated. How hastily, how fragmentarily I know, but I mean that I have netted that fin in the waste of waters, which appeared to me over the marshes, out of my window at Rodmel when I was coming to an end of to the lighthouse. So that's a fantastic passage in full, isn't it? it, it yes, it's hard to know on the spot what to make of it, but it does seem that she's in, She's, she's having that moment of being, but almost like a Lily Briscoe moment, the aha, mm -hmm. I've done it. Um, but even in the midst of that, there's that oscillation between saying and unsaying as she's feeling mm -hmm. and thinking, feeling and thinking. So it's, it, it's very layered, and quite fascinating. Yeah, and I think it's interesting, she talks about it as a physical sense of triumphant, something that I don't remember, <laughs> but that was wonderful, you yeah. know, that it's, that it's, it's this sort of, um oscillation between the uh sort of ecstatic space of the work and then the return into the body yeah absolutely yeah it seems to be a touchstone of, of a lot of what you've been talking about this afternoon in these really fascinating papers yeah absolutely thank you jane thank you yeah. um so we're about out of time but Thank you all for coming and having such a stimulating conversation. Thank you for all the great papers. Thank you. Wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think we can just leave this if you want to keep talking, anybody. I saved the chat if I saved it too. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good to save it yeah great. lots of great i have a note here to save the chat because i always <laughs> forget <laughs> i need a note that says start the recording <laughs> so hard. oh this is jane I, I imagine for you this was a really uh 
rewarding panel to attend given your interest it has been for me as well i've got yeah. so many ideas yeah it's been wonderful thank you all yeah really great okay. bye, bye. bye thank you all thank so you. much bye.